evening. Welcome to our author talk. Today we have the great pleasure of having with us Diane Galusha, a journalist, a historian, and an advocate for clean water. Diane, the mic is yours. Well, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate being invited here uh, and to uh, chat with all of you about one of my favorite subjects. Um, it is a huge topic, actually, the um, development of the New York City water system um, and um, stretches over a couple of hundred years, uh, many thousands of people involved, lots of uh, treasure, uh, lots of really interesting um, characters and politics and um, uh, all of the um, elements of a story that that is um, this big cannot possibly be uh, covered in an hour. Um, so I'm going to do my best and uh, uh, begin. I'm going to begin by um, uh, just kind of recognizing um, the the uh, the the fact, the kind of startling fact, actually, if you if you ever kind of stop and think about it, is that all of the water um, that will ever be on Earth is here today, uh, right now. There will never be any more. We uh, have they haven't figured out a way to manufacture a synthetic version. Uh, so put another way. We are still drinking and wasting and polluting and watering our gardens um, with, uh, with the water that the dinosaurs drank millions of years ago. So it, it's um, uh, kind of a sobering thought that, uh, that this is all we're going to have. And um, it is basically what makes Earth Earth. Water is what makes life here possible. Uh, yet just a fraction of 1% of all the water on Earth is accessible and potable. The rest is in the salty oceans or locked up in the ice sheets or in uh, deep aquifers underground or in the atmosphere or is hopelessly polluted. An estimated 1 billion people, perhaps one in 10 souls on the planet, do not have access to an adequate water supply to maintain hygiene and good health. Those who study this crisis see water, not oil, or the lust for lands or territory, or the terrorist threat as the trigger for the next global conflict. The lack of water breeds panic, desperation, and rage. Thirst is a primal motivator. So it's not surprising that thirst has, in many crucial ways, shaped the history of this country's largest city and consequently of the nation itself. Let me just share with you a few examples. The lack of water within the fort at New Amsterdam, Manhattan, is said to have played a role in the defeat of the Dutch by the British in 1664. Water was among the commodities manipulated by figures like Aaron Burr and Boss Tweed as they tried to capitalize on a basic human need. The city's expanding water supply was eyed by Confederate sympathizers as a target during the Civil War. Terrorists even then contemplated poisoning the supply or bombing the aqueduct that brought water from the wilds of Westchester County. For water, the city has spent its treasure and claimed the lands and treasures of others, rich and poor, famous and unknown. Dozens of towns were obliterated to build reservoirs in seven counties, reservoirs that were often constructed by immigrants whose cultural influence can still be seen in many watershed communities today. For water, the city has tried almost everything during an especially dry period in the middle of the last century, the big thirst compelled the city to hire a Harvard rainmaker to seed clouds over the Catskills. 
led apartment dwellers to collect rainwater in rubber boats on rooftops and forced the city to build a pumping plant to take water from the Hudson River. It even prompted the Brooklyn Dodgers to try to drill a well in Ebbets Field. But before the surveyors and the engineers and the contractors designed and built the reservoirs and aqueducts to serve a growing metropolis, there were the rivers, the waterways that spawned and nourished uh, first the Native Americans of the Hudson Valley and the Catskills, and later communities that would cluster on their banks. Folks along the Croton, the Esopus, the Delaware, the Schoharie, the Neversink, the Rondout could not have imagined that their domains would be claimed by an army of thirsty strangers in a city far to the south. But in fact, water has linked upstate communities um, to New York City and its suburbs since 1842. The little men with the picks and shovels, as City Mayor George B. McClellan described them, built an enormous and utterly amazing network of 18 collecting reservoirs, three lakes, and six balancing and distributing reservoirs three primary underground aqueducts and eight connecting tunnels carry a billion gallons of water a day, as much as 150, 120 miles by gravity alone to a distribution system of more than 6,000 miles of water main. Eight and a half people in New York and countless visitors to the Big Apple depend on this water supply. So do a million more who live in the suburbs as far north as Ulster County. Westchester County, for example, gets 85% of its water from the New York City system. Uh, the online exhibit Ebb and Flow developed by the New York City Department of Records offers a comprehensive look at water sources in colonial New Amsterdam and, and uh, the early efforts to provide water to the residents of Manhattan. Um, it also looks at the development and expansion of the Croton supply in Westchester and Putnam counties, which began in 1837, spurred by devastating fires and disease outbreaks caused in part by contaminated water. A largely Irish workforce built the first Croton system. It included a 42 mile long underground aqueduct connecting the primary reservoir in the town of Cortland, Westchester County, to a 31 acre receiving reservoir in what is now the Great Lawn of Central Park. Water was then conveyed to an above ground distributing reservoir at Murray Hill on the west side of Fifth Avenue between 40th and 42nd Streets. You may recognize this as the address of the New York Public Library, but for 60 years, an Egyptian styled edifice stood there 49 feet high, holding four acres of water behind masonry walls, which you can actually still see if you take a tour of the library, it's down near the auditorium in the basement of the library, um, some of those uh, original walls of that reservoir. The old Croton Aqueduct burrowed 42 miles beneath Westchester County and the Bronx, crossing the Harlem River to Manhattan on an arch span called High Bridge, a landmark that still stands, though it no longer carries water. This illustration shows the, uh, the, the, the tunnel that was later dug beneath the river to increase aqueduct capacity when the Croton Reservoir was expanded. A huge celebration with a five mile parade and parties throughout the city uh, welcomed Croton water to New York City in the fall of 1842. In the decades that followed, the city grew. By 1850, the population had grown to more than half a million uh, and spurred by the development of the modern bathroom, consumption rose, water consumption rose from 30 gallons per day per person to 78 gallons a day. 
By 1880, there were 1.1 million people in Manhattan. A decade later, 1.4 million residents, perhaps a third of them recently arrived immigrants, were consuming 145 million gallons of water each day. The city rushed to keep up with demand, building more reservoirs in Putnam and Westchester counties and trying to curb water waste by installing meters. Well, the network of reservoirs expanded. Boyd's Corners, the Middle, East, and West Branch Reservoirs, the Titicus, the Amawak, but there never seemed to be enough water. And with want came misery. Jacob Reese, a police reporter and photographer, in his 1890 book, How the Other Half Lives, documented the plight of a million city residents who lived in cramped squalor in 37,000 tenements. It no longer excites even passing attention when the sanitary police report counts 101 adults and 91 children in a Crosby Street house when a midnight or when a midnight inspection on Mulberry Street unearths 150 lodgers sleeping on filthy floors in two buildings. Describing an airless tenement on Cherry Street, Reese wrote, the, the sinks are in the the sinks are in the hallway that all the tenants may have access and all be poisoned alike by their summer stenches. Hear the pipe, the, hear the pump squeak. It is the lullaby of tenement house babes. In summer, when a thousand thirsty throats pant for a cooling drink on this block, it is worked in vain. This image from the New York Public Library's digital collection shows people gathered around a water pump positioned not so conveniently just steps away from the privies in back of a tenement building. A new Croton Reservoir and Aqueduct were constructed in the 1880s and 90s to try to meet this growing demand. A mostly immigrant workforce, many of them skilled stone workers from Italy, built this distinctive New Croton uh, Dam. Uh, this is a beautiful spillway here, the largest masonry dam in the world at that time, 2,168 feet long and 175 feet high. The 20 mile long reservoir is two miles across at its widest point. The original 1842 Croton Dam lies 33 feet beneath the surface when the reservoir is full. Also beneath the surface is the barren moonscape created by the removal of everything natural and man-made. Every house, every tree, every blade of grass, 2,000 people in four communities were displaced by this project. Told their town would be sacrificed to the rising waters of the Muscoot, a feeder reservoir to the New Croton, the leaders of Katona were not ready to consign their town to history. They moved it, all 50 some odd buildings. Between 1895 and 1898, Katona was relocated more than a mile from the original settlement. Designed by the Olmsted brothers, Katona became the first planned community in the nation. At about that time, the city got even larger when the residents of Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, the Bronx, and Manhattan voted to unite in 1895. Consolidation became effective on January 1st, 1898, when 56 separate cities and towns, including the city of Brooklyn, which until then had been the third largest city in the country, merged into Greater New York, a 360 square mile metropolis with a population of 3,350,000 people. And believe it or not, 2,000 farms. Manhattan and the Bronx were getting water from the Croton system. Brooklyn was pumping from the water bearing sands of Long Island. Queens and Richmond uh, on Staten Island were supplied from local wells operated by private companies. Brooklynites concerns about saltwater intrusion and pollution of groundwater by the steadily increasing pressures of development 
were among the factors that spurred the consolidation movement. During the decade that followed, 135,000 more people moved to the expanded city each year, and almost a quarter million more commuted every day from New Jersey, Westchester, and Connecticut to jobs in Manhattan. Even after the construction of 12 Croton system reservoirs and the claiming of three lakes, the need for water threatened to outpace the city's supply. And so with nearly all available rivers and streams tapped to the north and the city absorbing a rising tide of immigrants, city fathers at the turn of the century looked west across the Hudson River towards the Blue Mountains of the Catskills in search of more water. In November of 1903, the 980-page report of the Commission on Additional Water Supply for the City of New York recommended developing the Esopus Creek watershed in the Catskill Mountains of Ulster County and the Schoharie Creek watershed on the northern fringes of the Catskills in Schoharie County. The plan was approved by city and state authorities in 1905. The Ashokan and Schoharie Reservoirs, the Shandakan Tunnel that connects them, and the 92 mile long underground aqueduct that carries their combined waters to the city by gravity alone would take a generation to complete. The Catskill system included an enlarged storage reservoir at Valhalla, Westchester County, a balancing reservoir at Hillview in Yonkers, and a distributing reservoir at Silver Lake in the borough of Richmond to supply residents of Staten Island. An 18 mile tunnel drilled and blasted through bedrock, city tunnel number one, would serve as the main distribution artery uh, from Hillview Reservoir to water mains in the Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. A cast iron pipe would carry Catskill water beneath the narrows of New York Harbor to Staten Island. This many faceted project designed and built between 1906 and 1927 cost $180 million, more than 5 billion in today's dollars and involved more than um, 1300 engineers dozens of contracting companies and 17,000 immigrant African American and local laborers. It also displaced more than 3,000 people and destroyed or relocated 16 communities. One could argue that the Catskill Aqueduct was at the center of this monumental enterprise. In fact, some have compared it to the Panama Canal as one of the world's engineering marvels. Intrepid surveying parties first braved wild forests, precipitous rock ledges, and swarms of angry bees to plot the aqueduct route, meticulously charted to allow gravity alone to carry the water to its destination. Then it was up to the engineers and construction firms to dig, drill, and blast a tunnel through mosquito-infested swamps, shifting shale, and seemingly impenetrable granite, 250 men died building the aqueduct, which tunnels 1,100 feet beneath the bed of the Hudson River just north of West Point. The schematic is looking south toward West Point, and you can see the vertical construction shafts on both sides of the river with that they drilled, blasted, and, and, um, and drilled down to uh, tunnel grade and um, to and the crews on both sides of the river then tunneled towards each other um, to meet in the middle. It was a, quite a marvel of surveying. Well, again, the city rejoiced in 1917 when the first water from the Catskills began trickling into the new receiving reservoir in Central Park, known today as the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Reservoir it is no longer a functional part of the city's water system. Phase two of the Catskill system was the Schoharie project, 
The Gilboa Dam, shown here dwarfing the community for which it is named, impounds the north flowing Schoharie Creek and sends its water into the Shandaken Tunnel, which uh, burrows about 18 miles under a mountain to the Asopus Creek, which takes it to the Ashokan Reservoir and thence to the Catskill Aqueduct. So this, is, uh, this photo is showing what is known as the portal where the Schoharie uh, tunnel, the Schoharie water exits uh, and uh, um, goes beneath New York State Route 28 um, in Shandake and Ulster County to meet the Asopus Creek. The Schoharie project was completed in 1925. 500 more people were displaced. Their homes, businesses, farms, and community institutions leveled or burned. With completion of the Catskill system, the city had secured what it thought was plenty of water for its citizens. But uh, like anyone who has a, a few coins in their pocket, jingling away, uh, people had a tendency to use and waste what was readily available. And so they needed more. In the 1930s, the city turned its attention to the Delaware River. After a long battle with the states of Pennsylvania and New Jersey over rights to the river they share, the United States Supreme Court in a landmark 1931 decision gave New York permission to develop reservoirs which would take 400 million gallons of water a day from the upper Delaware River watershed. The Rondout and Neversink reservoirs located about 10 miles apart were then built more or less simultaneously beginning in the late 1930s. The projects were mothballed for most of World War II when material was hard to come by, but they finally went online in 1951. This is the, the wall that's um, basically cutting off uh, the Never Sink River. So those projects necessitated the taking of the communities of Eureka, Montella, Lackawack, Neversink, and the aptly named settlement of Bittersweet. This is actually a photograph of, uh, of the demolitions taking place. Kind of blurry, but you get the sense of the desolation. And then it was on to the Papacton Reservoir, which was constructed from 1947 through 1954. Its dam barricades the east branch of the Delaware River. This is the, the curved spillway. One thousand people were displaced by this reservoir. I don't know what the event was that got, that all the folks in Shavertown gathered, I think in the Grange Hall, but um, um, all of those people were personally impacted by this project. Some homes were moved, but most of the structures in the 5,000 acre basin were bulldozed and burned. Communities destroyed were Arena, Shavertown, Union Grove, and Papacton. The reservoir is the largest in the city's system, providing 25% of the city's supply. Unlike uh, earlier projects, the Delaware system dams and tunnels used motors over muscles and mules in their construction. Laborers lived in the vicinity rather than in specially constructed work camps. Many followed these public works jobs around the country their children attending local schools. Um, this was, uh, these were clearly huge um, employment opportunities for folks, local people, as well as um, uh, workers who traveled from these big jobs to, to the next big job around the country. They were known as Okies, Arkies, and Alabams to some of the folks who lived here. And unlike the Catskill Aqueduct, which in many places is very near the surface, the Delaware Aqueduct was blasted through bedrock for its entire length, including uh, a stretch 600 feet beneath the Hudson River uh, north of Poughkeepsie. 
still a very dangerous job. 54 men died during the construction of the Delaware Aqueduct. The aqueduct begins at the Rondout Reservoir and ends at Hillview Reservoir. At 84 miles in length, it remains the longest continuous tunnel in the world. A second city delivery tunnel was also blasted through bedrock during this period. In 1954, the city went to the Supreme Court again and successfully argued for a revised ruling allowing it to double the amount of water it could take from the interstate Delaware River system. This resulted in the construction of the Cannonsville Reservoir, which was created by damming the west branch of the Delaware River. Nearly 20,000 acres were taken, 31 square miles. Again, it was a case of the few giving way to the needs of the many. Five hamlets were claimed for Cannonsville, Beerston, Rock Royal, Rock Rift, Granton, and Cannonsville. Here is what the community of Cannonsville looked like before it was demolished to make way for the reservoir. You can see the river played a major role in its settlement and its development. And this um, is what it looked like when it was removed from the face of the earth. The Cannonsville Reservoir was finished in 1965. So about 5,500 people in 26 communities were displaced by the two Catskill and four Delaware system reservoirs. Properties were claimed by eminent domain, the process by which municipalities may legally acquire private property um, for the greater public good. Owners do not have a choice in the matter, though they are compensated. <clears throat> well, farms, schools, hotels, restaurants, railroads, community halls, post offices, churches, mills, businesses of all sorts were sacrificed. And of course, hundreds of homes and farms that in many cases had been occupied by generations of family members. The dead were also displaced. Thousands of graves were dug up and relocated to higher ground. The combined Catskill and Delaware systems supply 90% of the water consumed by millions of New Yorkers every day. The rest, of course, comes from the Croton system. So this uh, shows the location of the, this is the west of Hudson watershed uh, with the, um, the tunnels connecting the, the various reservoirs. The, for instance, the um, Delaware system the furthest west is, is the newest reservoir, it's the Cannonsville Reservoir. Uh, and it is connected to the Rondout Reservoir by the West Delaware Tunnel, which is 44 miles long. And the Papacton Reservoir uh, is uh, connected to the Rondout by the East Delaware Tunnel, which is 25 miles long. And the little Never Sink Reservoir at the bottom of the screen there is connected by this the seven mile never sink tunnel to the Rondout. So the Rondout is considered the, the, um, the terminal reservoir, the collecting reservoir there for all four um, uh, Delaware system reservoirs. And that is where the Delaware aqueduct begins at the Rondout reservoir to take the water to the city. And on the um, Catskill system side, there is the, mo the northerly most um, reservoir, the Schoharie, um, and it uh, takes water to the Esopus Creek via the Shandaken Tunnel and into the Ashokan Reservoir um, and then down into the city um, 
down to Kensico actually um, via the Catskill Aqueduct. <clears throat> Well, in the 1960s, the city drove a new tunnel, the five mile long Richmond Tunnel beneath Upper New York Bay to connect city tunnel number two in Brooklyn to Staten Island. There were installed the largest underground storage tanks in the world, holding 100 million gallons of water. The tanks replaced the use of Silver Lake Reservoir, but they remain the terminus of the Catskill system. 120 miles from the intake of the Schoharie Reservoir. And in 1970, construction began on the city's most ambitious public works project uh, to date, the 54 mile city tunnel number three. This 24 foot diameter tunnel connecting Hillview Reservoir to the Eastern and Southern areas of the city was finished in 2017. It was planned to improve delivery capacity, provide redundancy, and allow the aging city tunnels one and two to be shut down for inspection. They had never been inspected since they were um, activated um, at, uh, in um, the 19 teens and again in the 1930s. Uh, it was, um, uh, some workers known as sand hogs uh, spent the better part of their careers on this project and have seen their own sons and even grandsons take part in the ongoing mission to provide New York City with water. 23 of them died in the nearly half century it took to complete this massive undertaking. It will by now come as no surprise that New York City Department of Environmental Protection engineers and consultants continue to plot the future of the city's water system, which in the last few decades has had more to do with repairing leaks, um, incentivizing conservation and protecting water quality than in locating new sources for development. Maintaining what was constructed over the past century and a half is the DEP's primary mission today. That um, could be a program all by itself. This is the reconstruction of the Gilboa Dam, which was completed just a few years ago. Well, consumption of water has gone way down to below 118 gallons per person per day. While that's a big number, it's actually considerably less than in the 1980s when average per capita consumption was 207 gallons per day. Still, the New York City water supply provides about a billion gallons of clean, life-sustaining water to half the state's population every day. It is truly a feat worth celebrating. But let us also appreciate the many sacrifices that made this marvel a reality. Um, and I'm going to close this program with a Chinese proverb. When you drink the water, remember the spring. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Diane. Also, I'm going to uh, transfer the mic to Latonia Jones for questions. Okay, thank you, Diane. Um, can everyone who has a question please add it to the chat so that we can begin the Q&A. Okay, Shino asks, can you talk about the controversial issue around discharges from Ashokan into the surface? Uh, well, I can, I can tell you a little bit about what I know about it. Um, I, I don't know what the, the, um, the current status of that is. Um, I've been kind of away from uh, watershed uh, uh, affairs, if you will, for a couple of years. I retired a couple of years ago from the Catskill Watershed Corporation. Um, but um, in, in recent years, in recent couple, past couple of decades, actually, uh, the, the city has, um, the New York City DEP, which manages the reservoirs, has had to confront the issue of flooding uh, of uh, high water uh, 
below its reservoirs. It, it, these reservoirs were, of course, built as water supply reservoirs. They really weren't built as flood control reservoirs. Um, and um, so the city has had to um, uh, reorient its, its uh, thinking and its management to consider those communities that are downstream of the reservoirs when they um, create voids in the reservoirs in, in anticipation of a major storm event. Of course, that water goes downstream and affects um, communities downstream and property owners downstream. Um, the, the, um, the problem with the Asopus is um, uh, it's, it's a little more um, involved, I think. Um, uh, and I... Um, I know that um, there have been all kinds of negotiations about how to um, uh, how to manage those those downstream releases, um, and uh, I you know I I kind of hesitate to get into it um, because I'm I'm not really privy to to what's been happening. But although I do know that there has been a lot there have been um, there's been a lot of um, turbidity issues with the um, the the um, muddy releases being um, affecting the Asopus Creek water quality and then into the Hudson. So um, I know it's an issue. Um, I wish I could tell you more about it, but I'm not in the, in the position to do that. Okay, uh, next question. Ray asks, any reason that consumption of water per person in New York City has gone down? Uh, yeah, it has a lot to do. I don't know that people are drinking less, uh, although bottled water may have had some impact on that. But um, uh, they, this, the, I think back in the 80s, I believe the, uh, the city, you know, I mean, every few decades, the city is looking for um, new sources of water or additional sources of water. Uh, and um, in the 80s, I think it really just determined that it would be cheaper and easier to conserve what it had as a, than, than, than to go about the controversial process of condemning more land and creating, you know, another reservoir. So um, they got pretty serious about in, um, instituting um, universal metering and um, replacing leaking water mains and pipes um, and uh, incentivizing water conservation. Um, low flow toilets and low flow uh, water fixtures. So those um, activities alone, and they and they actively promote uh, the conservation of water, even while they actively promote um, uh, public uh, acceptance of tap water. Um, there are people in the city who say, you know, who, who question, you know, why is it off color maybe, or in their building, why, you know, wh why doesn't it look, you know, pristine? Um, and, and most of that has to do with um, building pipes that, you know, the, the, the laterals and the, the, um, the um, pipes that the plumbing in, in individual buildings. So the city has been trying to convince folks um, to um, not use, you know, plastic water bottles, which are themselves an environmental nightmare, and to um, to fill up their reusable water bottles with tap water, and um, it uh, seems to be working. And Christina asks, who owns the reservoirs? Then the city. Yes. Okay, uh, Don asks, um, how does water use per person in New York City compare with other large cities in the US? Boy, that's a very good question. I know that um, uh, there are um, many cities in the nation that have much um, more loss to leakage. I remember hearing this years ago. I don't know what the current statistics are, but um, you know, there are, um, New Orleans comes to mind, for instance, um, how, you know, that they lose something like a quarter or something like that of their water to, um, to leaks and, uh, and, and pipe failures. 
Uh, and I, I'm not sure what the number is these days for, for New York City's um, system. Uh, they have been working diligently to, to uh, replace those um, in-city pipes, as I mentioned, but they've also been working <clears throat> for the last several years to repair a huge leak in the Delaware Aqueduct um, at the, at, on, the, on the banks of the Hudson River or beneath the Hudson River actually, but um, they um, have, uh, are making great progress in constructing a, sec a bypass tunnel beneath the river, uh, which um, will uh, essentially um, skirt the leaking area and then they will close off that bad section and use the bypass tunnel. So this is, you know, I mean, the city has never stopped building or fixing its system. And this is another just monumental project that goes along day by day by day, by year by year, by million dollars by million dollars that people have no idea is even happening in order to make sure that New Yorkers have an uninterrupted supply of good, clean water. Okay. Uh, I'll just mention that Lou seems to it, when he indicated that water usage is higher than EPA average, um, and uh, so there may be leakage as well. So, um, Jonathan asks, are there any threats to the unfiltered status of New York City water? Uh, unfiltered in quotes. Um, yeah, this this kind of um, I don't know how uh, what the level of awareness is among the folks on this call about the um, the efforts to um, um, for the city to avoid filtering its water um, that that have been going on for the last 20 years 25 years I've lost track now um, but um, the city um, has to do a whole bunch of things has to fund a lot of a lot of water quality and environmental protection programs that are run by a number of agencies in the watersheds um, to, in order to keep its water clean at the source. This is um, federal, federal driven programs um, that um, uh, are, are intended to keep, to, to allow the city to avoid building a, a hugely expensive filtration plant that would filter a billion gallons of water a day. Uh, and um, it, you know, the city does chlorinate it and it does have a, um, a massive um, um, ultraviolet treatment facility where that all the water goes through um, before it, it um, gets into the delivery system. So it's not like it is not, uh, you know, protected or treated in any way. Um, but uh, so this filtration would be uh, a, a huge, a huge um, additional level of protection, but very expensive. And the rate payers in the city would would have to pay the burden, have to you know, bear the burden for that. So in 1997, a memorandum of agreement was signed. Um, by environmental parties, um, the, the New York City DEP, the state and federal governments and the watershed communities um, to uh, uh, institute these protection programs to, to help um, with this issue. Uh, and so uh, I, I suppose you could, you could say that what the threats to, um, to the filtration avoidance determination. I mean, it could, uh, you know, this is just my opinion, but it's always been uh, my thought that um, climate change may have um, a lot to do with that. Mother Nature may have a say um, in, in that um, more frequent and more severe storms, um, weather events, uh, may create such a turbidity problem that um, that it can't be overcome unless it's filtered. Um, I, I mean that is, it's probably an you know uneducated <laughs> opinion on my part, but 
I, I think that all the parties, other than that, I think all the parties uh, to the MOA are operating in good faith. And as long as the city can continue to fund these programs, I, I, uh, I really can't envision the, the fad being ended. Okay, David asks, uh, where can someone see more pictures and get more information on the reservoirs? And he mentioned that he lives in and overlooks the dam. Uh, so he's very interested in the history. Um, well, uh, there, I don't know whether um, links have been put up on the chat about um, a couple of um, uh, history sources. Um, you're, you're primarily interested in Croton, the Croton system, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, since that's where you live. Uh, um, I'd say there's a really wonderful exhibit at the Queens Museum uh, that um, has a lot of great photographs and um, a huge um, uh, model of the watershed that was created for the um, the New York World's Fair in 19, I think it was 37 or 39. Uh, that's a kind of an interesting um, uh, resource. Uh, there, there are also a few museums in Putnam County uh, that, that have, um, you know, photographs and, and Westchester also. Uh, I have to consult my list of places that I, that I went to when I was uh, writing the book. Um, I have a whole list of those resources in the back of the book if, um, if you have a copy of that or can get a copy of that. Uh, but but um, yeah, there's a, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, sources for localized history. You know, this, this is, as I mentioned at the outset, it's such a huge project, it's such, it's such a huge um, story. And really every part of it, every reservoir that was constructed um, deserves its own book. I mean, there, you know, all the, the colorful characters and the, um, the you know, uh, amazing feats that were accomplished and, um, you know, the, the, the lives that were upended uh, are, are worthy of their own books. And, um, you know, you have to kind of and there have been several have been written. Um, there's one. There's a great book about Katona uh, that you might look up. But I'm I'll just add that Margot added to the chat. Uh, Friends of the Aqueduct site um, is also a good resource. Um, Kay asks if do you know if the city's already planning more reservoirs? Uh, well, they don't call me and tell me <laughs> anything anymore if they ever did, but I would say that's highly unlikely. I mean, given the, the, the you know, tenor of society today, we're a very litigious society and, uh, and um, I'm sure that uh, all kinds of organizations and communities would rise up and, uh, and, uh, and prevent that from happening. I don't think they need it either. I mean, you know, back in the in the 80s, um, consumption, you know, ranged up to 1.6 billion gallons a day. And now I just looked at it yesterday. There's a um, you can you can find on the DEP website um, a daily um, accounting of the reservoir levels, what percentage full they are and how much um, was consumed the previous day. And uh, yesterday it said 0.98 billion, so below a billion gallons of water a day. So I, I, I mean, I have to, I have to think that there's plenty of water if people just use it carefully. And it's, um, and we keep getting rain, which we just got a couple of days ago. We got just torrents of rain, six inches or so in the headwaters of the Schoharie Creek, which serves the Schoharie Reservoir. So. I think um, if it keeps raining, you guys will keep drinking. Okay. Don asks, what do you know about the issue with resuspended detrital algae that flows out of the Cannonsville Reservoir when it's drawn down to about 65%, flowing down the West Branch and Upper Main Stem, Delaware River in a greenish gray color? Because the fishermen call it too thick to fish 
too thin to plow. <laughs> I, I I have to say I don't know anything about that issue. Is this a current issue right now? The the I mean the reservoir is not at fifty or sixty percent. It's it's much higher than that. I noticed that yesterday on the on the um on the website. So I I'm sorry I can't answer that question about algae. That would better be posed perhaps to the um, New York State DEC. Okay, and there's a lot of um, comments about how great a talk it was. And I'll just add that Mary Beth Majestic said that you interviewed her father-in-law years ago, Frank Majestic. He worked um, on Delaware Aqueduct and he was in your book. And okay. so she said thanks for a family of three generations that worked on the Delaware. Mm, lovely. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. This is a uh, this was amazing. It will be posted on our YouTube channel, um, you know, in few weeks. And remember, we have um, events every month. Uh, I share the link. Sign to our mailing list. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you all.